Welcome back to our online course on NCD prevention and control. This topic is about understanding of disease causation. And it is split into two parts. The first one here is about the concept of causation and the second part will go into different models of causation. The learning objectives of the first part are that you should be able to explain the concept of causation, list a couple of key characteristics of a cause, describe some causes of NCDs going beyond the classic or conventional causes, then you should be able to recall the Bradford Hill criteria of causation and also remember that there is in philosophy a critique of causality out there without that you have to know too many details about it. So let's get started and look at why cause and effect is so important and central to research. This cartoon is actually illustrating something very nicely. The guy is lecturing there and saying a cigarette tax hike will discourage smoking in Illinois. So a cause and effect he's postulating and somebody is even extrapolating it to what would a business tax hike discourage in return. Assuming that one relationship can be then also applied to the other one. So if that's that's the case then of course you know the argument against the tax hike. We need to urgently sort out what is cause and effect or what is not linked. You see that cause and effect understanding is basically the highest form of achievement in scientific knowledge, be it medical research but also public health interventions. Because once you know about the cause, you can design, develop rational plans and actions to break the link between factors causing the disease and ultimately to prevent the disease itself. Causal knowledge in turn can also predict the outcome of an intervention and help treatment of a disease. And already Hippocrates said some years ago that to know the cause of a disease and to understand the use of the various methods by which the disease may be prevented amounts to the same thing as being able to cure the disease. And you can imagine back then to cure the disease was basically the, the highest form of knowledge, of insight, of, of power. So that's how important it is to have an, if an understanding of cause and effect. But does this all apply to NCDs? When you look up the definition of cause or causality, and I always recommend you to consult a dictionary such as John Lass, my favorite dic dictionary of epidemiology, then you see that the distinction between a necessary cause being a causal factor whose presence is required for the occurrence of the effect and sufficient causes as a minimum set of conditions, factors or, or events needed to produce a given outcome. So for, for instance the tuberculosis bacillus is required to cause tuberculosis. So it's certainly necessary but on the other side, it's not a sufficient cause. Not everybody being exposed to the tubercle bacillus will get tuberculosis. And there are some other examples. So specific causes such as tuberculosis, uh, tu tubercle bacillus or high glucose levels become necessary ones for their diseases. However, for complex multifactorial diseases, such as, for instance, as an example, obesity, at least at the present, we don't have necessary causes. Therefore, the concept of sufficient causes has veered from single causes to explain disease to group causes or multiple causes. And that is 
very important for NCD epidemiology. Now, what are the key characteristics of a cause? We already heard that cause must precede the effect. Has to come before. But a cause can either be a host or an environmental or a biological factor, so a, a range of things, and you should have all those factors and things in mind. Characteristics, conditions, actions of individuals, events, natural events, social or economic phenomena, uh, biological events, etc. Et and it's also important to point out that a cause can be either positive or negative. And with that I mean the positive being the presence of the cause or the causative exposure leads to disease or the opposite negative is the lack of a preventive exposure. Now let's talk about what causes NCDs. And you will be surprised if you look up the literature, if you scan the internet about causes of non-communicable diseases, there is actually not much to be found. Heaps of information you find about what NCDs are causing, that's, that's the leading cause of mortality, morbidity, burden of disease in many countries and globally alike. But the other way around, what is actually causing NCDs, it's very thin. People don't like to answer that question. Here I found something. Chronic non-communicable diseases are caused by interaction between numerous environmental and socio-economic factors and a biological response of the human body, which I think is quite a good answer. But it's very generic because you have to find out what kind of environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, and what kind of biological response of the human body we are talking about, and what kind of interaction is there. But that all illustrates the complexity of finding a cause for NCDs. And then this article said NCDs are gaining importance due to the fact that they largely depend on common risk factors, of which more than 70% can be prevented. That highlights that there are modifiable or preventable risk factors and other risk factors, non-modifiable, sometimes also called determinants, and also that risk factors are different from causality. We will have later in the course a whole segment on risk factors. But I'm sure you have all your own ideas on what could be causes of NCDs. And I like to extend your ideas by two examples. So go a little bit beyond the classic, beyond the conventional uh, causes, obesity causes, um, diabetes, high blood pressure causes, strokes and things like that, or are those only risk factors? Here, let's extend it. Two um, examples. One is what I like to term uh, causality at the nexus between NCDs and CDs. If you look at this figure, then you see two lines, the red one being infectious diseases and the bluish one representing NCDs. And you could imagine that those lines interact at various points. I listed only six, but there are many, many points. And actually at very different dimensions, here at fetal life, here at epigenetics, inflammation is also an intersection between infectious diseases and NCDs, because we know that underlying non-NCDs are chronic inflammations. But then also the health system or the lack of a or the absence or the lack of access to a good health system will have impact on both diseases could cause complications for one or the other. Or the environment or human behavior can cause one or the other. Think about urban environments overcrowding, leading to more infectious diseases, but also being at the cradle of more NCDs. So we are realizing that communicable and NCDs intersect at various points at various levels and could actually enhance each other. For this reason, we later also have one topic about the nexus 
between NCDs and CDs with a pr presentation of one of my esteemed colleagues, Professor Ip Birkberg. The other example I wanted to share with you, which could broaden your understanding of what can be involved in causing NCDs, is something called the Intergenerational Cycle of Diseases. It's published by um, Gluckman in New Zealand 2005 in a series of articles, actually. Here you find illustrated again the same um, connection between communicable diseases and NCDs through chronic inflammation and vice versa NCDs for, for instance diabetes uh, resulting in uh, immune suppression which is increasing then the risk of infectious diseases so you have this one cycle but then we have also the other cycle a known unhealthy pregnancy fetal environment problems leading to suboptimal fetal programming leading to NCDs later in life which then puts the young mother at higher risk of gestational diabetes which then in turn causes the same uh, similar effects on on the pr pregnancy and then on the offsprings and this could be also linked to the other cycle and fueled by obesogenic environments toxic environment which then if we have for instance a small low birth weight baby being overfed in early years is then known to be at increased risk for NCDs. So these two cycles are actually occurring in two levels. I need to have a 3D picture to best illustrate that that they can become self-perpetuating and producing the next cycle of diseases involving different mechanisms from the first one. Very interesting paper for some advanced reading if you have the time. Now, when is a cause actually causing a disease? You think that might be a silly question, but actually I want to start answering this question by the opposite. When is a cause not a cause? So the difference between causation and correlation. And I found a very funny example. I didn't know personally myself, but read it and then looked up the video. Um, some decades ago, it was actually speculated in the US that ice cream would be the cause of polio. And if you like to know more, then you c should check out this video um, from the book Freakonomics, Freakonomics, which is an ex excellent book, by the way. Um, on YouTube, we published a link on our website there you see the historical reasons why back then they were thinking ice cream caused polio a classic case of correlation being mistaken for causality there are many more examples and later we have to then answer well how can you distinguish if it's a correlation and versus a causation. But let's look now at the critique of the concept of causality. Again, this is more advanced reading and so on and not directly applicable to your everyday life, but you should at least know about it and read about it. Or if you don't have the time to engage in reading philosophy books, then you could watch this other YouTube uh, link, which is um, highlighting the critique of David Hume, his view on cause and effect, where he essentially says that we cannot prove causality, but we are always um, misled by the temporal relationship just because one follows the other, we often is assume causality. But Immanuel Kant then also um, in the 18th century um, formulated a response. It's worthwhile checking out um, those philosophers, um, especially David Hume, can be quoted with a lot of interesting quotes. Um, I pulled out one, a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. And I think this is also relevant to all your chronic disease epidemiology, stick to the evidence. Now, when is a cause a cause? What are criteria for proving causality and there 
I come back to the Bradford Hill criteria, which is interesting that they are named Bradford Hill because Bradford was his second name and Hill his last name, so it should be the Hill criteria for causation. You should have had them in your lectures and courses on epidemiology, so I'm not going through them in detail other than posting them here, the strengths of the association, consistency, specificity, temporal relationship again, and the gradient, uh, or so-called a dose-response relationship, the more you smoke, the more you are at risk, plausibility, coherence, experiment, reversibility, and some analogy are the nine criteria. We also put in the readings the original paper from 1965. But in case you want to have a refresher on what those criteria mean and stand for and a bit more insight, and you should actually know them very well because they're so important in epidemiology, not only for NCDs, then why don't you go to the healthknowledge.org, a website from the UK Here's the www.healthknowledge.org and Google in there causation and you will come to this, this long address and a very nice um, primer and online course you can do, sh a very short one, it's, it's just a chapter on causation in epidemiology association and ca causation. Highly recommended. Let me summarize. We talked a lot about the different factors and even the philosophy behind causation. But here's a summary. If you forget everything, then remember one acronym when you think about what factors could be involved in causing NCDs. And with that, we are at the end of our module on concept of causation in the introduction of our online NCD course.